He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in still another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30 years old. And then for three and a half years, he was a traveling preacher. He never wrote a book, never held an office, never owned a home. He did not go to college. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place of his birth. He did none of the things that the world associates with greatness. The tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. He was turned over to, the, to his enemies and went through a mock trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And while he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only material uh, thing that he owned on his planet, which was his clothes. When he was dead, he was placed in a borrowed tomb. 20 centuries have come and gone, and, and today he remains the central figure of the human race. All the armies that ever marched, all the governments that ever convened, all the kings that ever reigned, all the, ec the economies that ever functioned, all the celebrities that ever shined, all of them combined, all of them combined, have not affected life on this planet as much as that one life. Of course, I'm talking about Jesus. And today we look at his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And, and I know we get to this time of year and we're thinking about Friday and we're thinking about next Sunday. But we cannot miss the message of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We call it Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of Holy Week. But, but what is Holy Week? What is it really all about? Well, it's God manifesting himself, revealing himself, and sharing himself with the world. That's what it's about. It's him letting everybody know exactly who he is. Uh, we have scripture to kind of explain a little bit about who he is. Uh, John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John 4, uh, 1, 14 tells us who the word is. The word is Jesus himself. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This, he, God is always revealing himself. He's always speaking to us. Romans chapter 1 tells us that he explains who he is through the very creation. We see his very Godhead in the creation. Colossians tells us, for in him, that is Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is the physical manifestation of God. Not just another guy, not just some other, another prophet, not just a miracle worker, not just a really good guy, but God in the flesh. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 tells us that Jesus being the brightness of his glory and the express image, the actual image of his person, God himself. And upholding all things by the word of his power. And when he had uh, by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. God, the creator and sustainer of everything, reveals himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And Holy Week is kind of the culmination of that revelation. It kind of all comes, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's like, it's like, um, Remember, remember when you were younger, uh, you had the, the, the magnifying glass and the light came through and you wanted to burn the paper and you kind of kept tweaking it and turning it and tilting it until it came to a dot and then it would burn the paper. That's kind of, uh, all of creation kind of focuses to this point in time, Holy Week. And, you know, God, uh, he performs Three acts, he reveals himself, uh, uh, three divine truths that tells us who he is. And he provides three eternal blessings. And, and that's what we're going to look at. I know there's kind of a lot up there right now, but this is what we're going to look at this Holy Week. We're, today we're going to look at his majesty, majesty displayed through the gates of Jerusalem. He comes, he comes uh, uh, through Jerusalem on a donkey. We're going to be talking about that and how it shows his sovereignty. It answers the question, who are you, Jesus? He says, I am king. And he is the king of kings that offers peace, peace between us and him. On Friday, we're going to look at love demonstrated through the cross. And Friday is always a tough day. 
I know we call it Good Friday, and it is certainly good for us, but it's, 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 there's a, a kind of a, a lot of emotion involved in that. And, but we're going to look at that on Friday. We're going to have our Friday uh, service at uh, 6.30 here. And, but we're going to see the humanity of Christ because only, only a human can die. God can't die. So he became flesh so that he could do that. And he's the savior of souls that offers salvation. And then, you know, we get through Friday. We don't, we don't get over Friday. We get through Friday to Sunday. And Sunday uh, is hope delivered through the empty tomb. It didn't, the story doesn't end at the cross. There's the empty tomb. And through that, we're going to see his divinity. We're going to see his Godhead. We're going to see that the one who conquers death has come, and he is the Lord of life that offers us heaven, the promise of heaven. We're going to see all of this this week. Today, we'll look at the triumphal entry. We'll look at the king. Now, I know in this country, we don't, don't, I don't know if we can wrap our minds completely around what it means to have a king. Other countries still have kings and queens. Uh, Not not a lot anymore, but there are some that, that do... I don't know if we really grasp what that means. The king was the complete sovereign of the nation. And God, Jesus, is the king of all kings. And we're going to see that. So let's take a look at Matthew 21, uh, beginning, beginning in verse 1. We read, When they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, And immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. That's dynamic, huh? Isn't that that like explosive and exciting and, 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 and fireworks? And it's kind of a common event, right? At least it seems like it. But in reality, it's everything that I just described. We look at that. That's because, see, whenever God is in something, it takes something from being normal and natural to being supernatural. Whenever God's hand is in something, it transforms everything. And, and, and that's what we see happening here. This was actually foretold uh, um, uh, 520, year, 520 B.C., by the prophet Zechariah. And this is what Zechariah wrote. This is, this is 500 years before it actually happened. Okay? He writes, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 500 years before it happened. It was revealed to the prophet who revealed it to us. And then, and then it takes place. I mean, now you've got to understand also, the, the people of that time knew their Bibles really well. So seeing this happening, they knew exactly what was going on. There was no, hmm, that's odd. I wonder what's happening today in Jerusalem. That was not what was happening. They were, they were amped up. They were excited. They were like, it's actually happening right now. And we have these three elements that I just kind of want to touch on a little bit today to, 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 to point out the significance to us 2,000 years later. It was certainly significant to them. I mean, the whole city came out. The Pharisees were losing their minds. They're like, everybody, the whole, they, actually the Pharisees said, the whole world is going out after him. We'll talk about that in a minute. But let's take a look. Let's take a look at some of the common elements that when God's hand is upon it, makes it uncommon, makes it supernatural, makes it uh, divine almost, at least the event. So he he rides in on a donkey. Have any of you ever rode on a donkey? Anybody ever rode on a donkey? It's not fun. You know, it's not right. It's not like, so, so, yeah, a donkey, a donkey is, um, if we were saying like cars, how many of you remember the old Pinto from the 70s? That would be a donkey compared to a Ferrari, okay? It wasn't necessarily a big fun thing, but it was, it was incredibly significant, more significant than what we uh, at first look at. So let's take a look. Mark eleven seven 7 says this. 
And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And then we go to Matthew 21, where it picks up from there, in verse 4. It says, this took place to fulfill that which was spoken by the prophet, which we just read. And look at the words, saying, uh, uh, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming. So this is, this is what's going on. As he's coming in, they're saying this. Uh, um, behold, your king is coming, humble and mounted on a donkey, and a, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So if we were back then, okay, we'd be sitting there, uh, we'd be standing there, we'd be cheering. But as he's coming in, we'd be saying to each other, hey, hey Todd, remember what Zechariah said? It's happening right now. This is what Zechariah said. And, and then we'd be reciting it back to each other. We'd be looking at what's happening. It would be lighting us up. But why? Why? Well, when a king came into a city on a donkey, it was, only, it was reserved for kings. Uh, it, it, was, it was a special event. It was unique. It was something specific. So a king would, if a new king was coming in and, and, and conquering a land, or, or, or he would come into the gates of a city, and it would always be the main gates, on either one of two animals, either a donkey or a war stallion. Okay, one of the two, either the Pinto or the Ferrari, okay? And if they came in on the war stallion, it would be like a general or a ruler kind of coming in on a tank. He's coming to do the conquering. He's coming to make war. He's coming to, to show everybody who he is. He's, he, it's, 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 the, it's the battle, okay? However, if he came in on a donkey... It means the battle has already been won and he's coming to offer peace to the people that he has just become the king of. So the significance is huge. Jesus didn't ride in on some big massive stallion to let everybody know, hey, I'm coming to, 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 I'm going to defeat all you people right now. From God's eternal perspective, the battle had already been won. He had already, from God's perspective, he had already conquered death, hell, and, and the grave. And, and, and this was the beginning of showing the people how that was mapping out. And so he comes and, and, and he says, I'm coming to bring peace between you and your king. And we see that in Romans chapter 5. Verse, verse 1. Verse 1, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with who? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, the king of kings, came, conquered death, hell, the enemy, the grave. Why? So that we can now have peace with him. As Isaiah says, he took out that partition, that middle wall that divided us uh, between us and God. Malachi says that God's eyes are so pure, he doesn't, he doesn't want to look upon sin. So he comes in the form of flesh, in the form of man, and says, I'll take care of this. I'm the king. I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to conquer this, and I'm going to bring peace. So as king, he comes on this donkey, which we think, a donkey? That's it? That's not so dynamic. Go back to 2,000 uh, years ago in Jerusalem, and you have about 3 million people. Imagine 3 million people erupting in praise and thanksgiving for the king, come, their king, finally coming in. Now, we know it was short-lived. Okay, because just a few days later, some of those same voices perhaps were calling for something else. But they recognized, here he comes. Here's the king that comes to offer peace. And, and, and what do they do? So the next, the other, the next significant uh, aspect of this is uh, the clothes and the palm branch. See, all three of these things together, uh, any one of them is, is just an event. But when you put all three of these together, it becomes something very different. It becomes very symbolic. And they have these clothes and these palm branches. They put clothes over the donkey, pin the ride on. They lay palm branches down on the ground and even their own clothes on the ground for the donkey to ride over. Okay? Uh, so let's take a look at what this signifies. Uh, in Luke chapter 19, it says, in beginning of verse 36, And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. We go to, to the next part of it, and, and it picks up in John chapter 12. Uh, and they took branches of palm trees 
and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. So the disciples are putting all of these things down, putting their, their cloaks on the, on the donkey just for the comfort of the king. Just to, just to serve. And you think, you think, okay, there are some great people throughout history that have served God in great ways. No greater than somebody putting their cloak, their, their shirt, their, 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 their robe on, on, a, on the donkey. God uses everything in his king, in his kingdom, for his purpose, for his plan. And that's what we see here. Uh, they, they placed the palm branch in the road, which was a very, very uncommon act. This was, everybody that came into Jerusalem did not come in on uh, um, palm branches. This was, again, reserved for a new king entering the city. The old king has been destroyed. The old ruler has been destroyed. The devil has, been, has lost. And the new king, Christ, comes in. Now, you say, yeah, but Friday hasn't happened yet. Sunday hasn't happened yet. Not from their perspective, but from God's, from his eternal perspective, he's already won the battle. It was never in doubt. God, God wasn't driving into Jerusalem saying, I hope this is going to work. All right? That wasn't going on. He's not driving in. He's not riding in there thinking, oh, man, I hope I, 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 I know I could have picked any number of plans. I hope I picked the right one. It was done. It was a done deal from eternity past. This was already taken care of. Now it's unfolding in front of us, his sheep, his people. And that's what we see happening here as they, they take these branches and they take these cloaks and they put them over the donkey and they put them on the very road. Now, imagine, this is kind of weird, I know. Imagine being that donkey. I, I don't know if we can actually imagine that, but try. You know, one, you're not very bright. You're not very strong. You're not very anything. You just, you're just a donkey, you know. I know some of you, uh, some of you ride horses. How many of you uh, are horse, horse people? Yeah. Donkeys and horses are, are different, right? They're a little different. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, they, but now all of a sudden, you know, you don't, you don't really give a, a donkey a second look. You would give a war stallion a second look. If I, well, now, if I, came, if I came to church this morning on a donkey, you'd be like, what is wrong with pastor? Okay, so yeah, you'd give that a second look. But, but you know what I'm saying. You're going down the road. You don't give the, like normal cars a second look. But if somebody drove into the parking lot today in a souped up Ferrari, we'd notice that. We'd be like, what's going on here? Jesus comes in on a donkey. But all of a sudden, the donkey is elevated and they put these things on the ground for the donkey to, ro to, to walk over. This is something reserved for kings. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, yeah, I, I am the king. I have come. I am your new king. The old king is dead. And, and, and listen to what's, what's being said here. Um, they, they cry out. They cry something out. And these words are very significant. They cry out, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna in the highest. And we see that in Matthew 21, verse 9. It says, the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This was a, 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 an absolute verbal recognition of divine royalty. This, is, this goes all the way back to the Psalms. This goes all the way back to the promise to, uh, uh, to David that he was going to have somebody on the throne from his, uh, his line for all eternity, forever and ever. This was not Okay, we got to call him something. Uh, okay, Hosanna to the... No, this was, this was very, very... Uh, uh, not only significant, but this was very intentional. They were recognizing him as king. And, and not just any king. By calling him the son of David, they were recognizing his right to the throne forever. That was prophesied a thousand years earlier. And we see uh, this promise in... Uh, um, 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verse 13. God says, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. A promise to David. And they are now associating that with Christ coming in. <laughs> they also use the term Hosanna, which means save now. And, and it pictures uh, Jesus not only as king, but the Messiah who would be king of kings. That's the, uh, see, every, every, 
every jot, every tittle, every word, every uh, uh, picture, every illustration, every everything in Scripture is there for a specific reason, for a purpose. This word Hosanna, this word uh, 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 changes him from being a human king to the Messiah king, the one that would save everyone, not just during the, I know some of the people got it, they, they were confused, they got it wrong, they wanted, they really wanted to be saved from Roman oppression. My dad used to uh, be a tough guy, and, and, and you know, he, we, we, would, we would wrestle and, and, and fight every now and then, and, and I remember one day coming up coming into the living room, and, and he was sitting there, and, and, and I got into a fighting stance, ready to, to, to wrestle and fight with my dad, right? And, and, and he looked over at one of my uncles and said, why don't you handle my light work? Right? And I looked at him, I'm like, fine. The Romans would have been the light work. Do you understand that? The Romans would have been the light work. You say, Roman, Rome was one of the greatest empires in all of history. That would, would have been the light work. That would have been the easy stuff. The Messiah, the King of Kings, the, the Hosanna to the, and the high. He came not to just, not to conquer Rome. That's his light work. He came to conquer death, hell, the grave, the enemy, and the sin itself. He came to conquer everything that is against us. The most powerful enemies to humanity in all of history, he came to conquer. And by them saying this, this was them recognizing you're not just any old king. I know you came in on a donkey. I know we're putting palm branches down, but you, oh my goodness, Hosanna to the son of David. You are the Messiah king. And that should affect us today. Uh, uh, Nathaniel got it right. Some of, the, some, of the, uh, some of the apostles don't get a lot of press. You know, you get, everybody knows, everybody knows David, um, Peter, right? You all, you all heard of Peter? Peter the apostle? How many of you have heard of um, John? James, okay, we're good so far. A little bit later on, uh, Paul, okay. But Nathaniel, what did he do? Well, he did something very significant. Oops, I think I missed it. There it is, yeah. Nathaniel answered, uh, and it says, and Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king, the king of Israel. See, Nathaniel saw something. He saw that Jesus was not just some regular guy. He wasn't even just some regular king. He was the king of Israel. Remember, Israel had not had a king on the throne, a real king on the throne, from David's line for a long time. And then David come, uh, then uh, Jesus comes in to fill that role. And Nathaniel says, that's who you are. I recognize you now. Have you recognized Jesus? Can you recognize him? Do you recognize him? And I know we're in church, and you're probably thinking, yeah, of course we recognize him. We're all Christians. Do you recognize him? Do you recognize what he has done throughout history, from the very moment of creation until now and throughout eternity future? Can you recognize the king? Throughout all of this, the Pharisees did not recognize. The ones you think should have done the recognizing. These were the guys that knew the Old Testament scriptures, the First Testament, cover to cover, word for word, frontwards and backwards, in Hebrew. And they missed it. They completely missed it. They were losing their minds as they looked around and saw millions. Remember, there were probably around two to three million extra people in Jerusalem at this time during this festival, during this feast, during this celebration, okay? And they're all erupting in praise and in thanksgiving. And they said in John chapter 12, verse 19, look, the world has gone out after him. I wonder, can we lead the world to say this today? I want you to think about that for a second. We're talking about 2,000 years ago. We're talking about the enemies of Christ there in, in all of their authority and all of their pomp and all of their, their self-righteousness and self-assurance standing there. And common people 
worshiping the king, celebrating the king, gets these guys to say, the whole world, the whole world's following this guy. I wonder if we can, we as the children of God, as the followers of Christ today, as his disciples today, I wonder if we could live lives and, 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 and recognize his kingship in our lives to such a degree that the world, that the enemies of Christ look and say, everybody's following this guy. I wonder if we could do that today. Three million visitors to Jerusalem during Passover week. Man, thousands upon thousands lining the road between Bethany and, and, and Jerusalem, crying out uh, 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 to their Savior, celebrating the Savior. What did that sound like? I've been to some concerts in my day. How many of you have ever been to a concert, like a live concert? Okay. I won't tell you which ones I went to because it was back before I knew Jesus, so I don't want you to, to look at me any differently. But I've been to some concerts. And you know what I noticed about concerts? People lose their minds. They completely, right? They completely lose their minds. Do you ever watch uh, documentary, documentaries on like the Beatles or, the, or, or Elvis? I'm not that old. That's not one of the ones that I, I went to, okay? I was, I was like a, a puppy, okay? But you look at what was going on. They, were, they lost their minds over a sweaty guy singing music. I mean, I mean no disrespect to the king of rock and roll, but that's all it was. We got the king of kings coming in, and people with a reckless abandon are just crying out to him. After hundreds and hundreds of years of oppression and, and, and being, being under a, a foreign rule, they finally see the hope coming in on a donkey. On a donkey. Man, what must that have sounded like? It, it fits with Scripture. Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 13, 15, By him, therefore, let us offer. So our praise, our worship is an offering. Okay? Let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God how many times? How much? I'll, I'll, I'll lead you down this road again. Ready? By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God. Do you know what the word continually means in the Greek? It means continually. <laughs> it's a deep word, a deep meaning. It means all the time. It means your life and my life should be lived in an expression of praise and honor and, and obedience to the king that's come into our lives. It's amazing. It goes on to say that that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And I'm not just talking about rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, let's eat. I'm talking about our lives, our, our voices, our hearts, our minds, our souls, our spirit, worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The sacrifice of, play, of praise is when we put ourselves on the back burner. This is what, this is what you want to know what praise is because people think, Okay, praise means singing. That's a part of it. We can certainly sing praises to the Lord. We can certainly praise the Lord in a number of different ways. It all boils down to this. It all boils down to, to putting ourselves on the back burner and focusing our hearts on the God who deserves all worship, all praise, all honor, all glory. That's what it, that's what it truly means to worship God, is to put ourselves behind on the back burner, like, like John John, what did John say in John 3.30? John said, I, I must decrease, but he must increase. He actually said it the other way. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease, right? That's an offering of praise. And when these people erupted in that, they were fulfilling scripture. They were fulfilling prophecy. Amazing. Now, it's ironic that they were crying out, Hosanna, save now, because that's the very reason why he came, right? Jesus didn't come to... I want, I'm going to, I want you to walk with me through this just for a second. Jesus did not come to perform miracles. He did not come to uh, um, um, feed 5,000 with a couple of loaves of bread. He did not come to walk on water. He did not come to heal the sick. He did not come to raise 
uh, a couple of people from the, from the dead. He didn't come. He did all that. I don't deny that in the least bit. He did all of that. It was all part of his ministry. But that's not the driving force to why he came. He came, as he said in Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And guess who that is? Us. Every one of us. Who has ever lived from Adam till whatever baby was just born in the latest hosp- in the hospital nearby. Every single one of us. Every single human being who has ever drawn breath. Every single human being who has ever lived, he came to save. God, as king, came to save you and me. Does that blow your minds? He came to save our children, our neighbors, our relatives, our family, and our friends. He came to save us, to deliver us from the power of sin, death, and hell. He came to make peace with us. Isaiah 1, 18, one of the most baffling verses in all of Scripture, in my opinion. Come now, let us reason together. That part right there is the part that blows me away. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Do you understand what's being said? The king of all kings, the creator, the one who with a thought, with a word, created everything that's here, created life itself, created time and space, created everything. He says, come on up to the table. Let's sit down. We got a problem. You, 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 you're on the road to a very bad place. I don't want you there. So I'm coming to rescue you. Now, when you think about who actually is saying this, it's mind boggling. It's mind boggling. And why would he do that? Why would God, why would the Messiah, why would the the only king that is worthy of the name king, why would he come to rescue me and you and our children and our neighbors? Why would he, why would he do, does any of us, Do any of us deserve that? He loves us. He loves us. And it's because of his love for us, that's why he wants to save us. We read in in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering. You know what the word long suffering means? Another tricky one. It means to suffer long. Okay? It's, 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 but it's more than that. It's, 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 like a, it's almost like a never-ending patience, kind of, okay? To us word. Ready? Look at this. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Have you ever felt down on yourself? Have you ever felt unworthy? Have you ever felt small and insignificant? Probably many of us on a regular basis. We know us. We look in the mirror, we're like, that's it? I know some people look in the mirror like, hmm, that looks pretty good. But most of us are normal. You know, most of us are like, Phew. you know, you get to the end of the day, and, and, and I know there are times, you know, I'll, I'll get a, have a busy day, whatever. I get to the end of the day, and I look in the mirror I'm like, that's all you had to offer today? That was it? That's all you did? You're kind of small and weak and puny. You ever, you ever feel that way? You ever feel small in the eyes of God? Probably all the time in the eyes of God you feel small. But look at this. Even the smallest of us, even the the most unworthy of us, God is not willing that you should perish. But instead, because of his love for you, has come to rescue you and come to rescue me. This was... A little bit before my time, but we all, we all, you guys all recognize the, the, the name Calvin Coolidge? Okay. One day when he was vice president, he was presiding, was that? He was presiding over the, the, the Senate, okay? 
And one senator got mad at another senator. And he angrily told him, he said, go straight to hell. Yeah, that's how they talked on the Senate. Kind of like that today, too, <laughs> okay? Uh, um, and, and, and one senator got so mad, he said, you go straight to hell. And that senator was very offended. And, and Coolidge, who was the, he, because he was the vice president, he was presiding over, over it. And he went to, to the vice president and he complained. And, and the, as the story goes, uh, the vice president was, he had, a, he had a book in his hand and he was leafing through uh, as he was listening to what was going on. And when the guy complained, this is what Calvin Coolidge said. He said, he said uh, I've looked through the rule book and uh, you don't have to go. You don't have to go. And you know what? That applies to each and every one of us today. I've looked through the rule book. We don't have to go. I know when we're born, we are born with the sin nature and, and in need of a savior, in need of a king, in need of the, the Messiah king. I know that. But we don't have to stay that way. For God so loved the people that he really liked. No. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever should call upon him, should trust in him, should follow him, should, should, should embrace him, will have everlasting life. If we follow the king. You see, heaven is not, heaven is not like this church. Uh, we, we had a, uh, a state trooper come in to kind of tell us, help us with security measures, to, to kind of make sure our security was good. And the first thing he said to me, he said, wow, you got a lot of doors getting into this church. If you ever walked around a church, I think there's what, like 28 of them or 27 of them, something like that. A lot of doors, a lot of ways. To, he said, this is what he said, he said, there's a lot of ways to get into this church. People feel that way about heaven too. But there's not. There's one. Well, that's not fair. Well, you can take it up with the owner. Right? You can, take it out, you can take that up with the owner. It comes down to, are you willing to follow the king? I'm, I'm gonna, I got a, a, a video for you right now. I want you to just kind of listen. Uh, uh, one, this guy's voice is, is, is that I wish I had this voice to, to preach in. But listen to the words. No other king could vanquish the war horse or silence the warrior's rage while riding the lowly back of a donkey. No other king could break the dominion of darkness, the tyranny of evil, with a reign of grace and a kingdom of peace. No other king could give his life for the redemption of rebels, his wealth to welcome the outcast. Jesus is that king, the king of glory, son of the living God. Not just another king, not just another prophet, not just another teacher. He was the one the world had been waiting for, the one to deliver us from captivity, the son of David and Abraham's chosen seed. He is the goal of the Mosaic law, Yahweh in the flesh. He is the one to establish God's reign and rule to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim good news to the poor. This Jesus was the creator come to earth and the beginning of a new creation. He embodied the covenant, fulfilled the commandments, and reversed the curse. This Jesus is the Christ that God spoke of to the serpent, the one prefigured to Noah in the flood, the one promised to Abraham, the one guaranteed to Moses before he died, the one promised to David during his reign, the one revealed to Isaiah as a suffering servant, the one predicted through the prophets and prepared for through John the Baptist. He is the Father's Son, Savior of the world, and substitute for our sins. More loving, more holy, and more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. He is our Jesus, and there is no other king like him. He is our God, our glory, our victorious Savior.
There is no other king like him. There is no other king. We're left with this question. Who is Jesus to you? Is he your king? Have you trusted him as Lord and Savior? If so, we have the honor of honoring him as king here on earth. We do that by the offering of our lives, by the celebration of, of, of how we, we serve him and obey him. But if you have not trusted in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And, and, and please, don't take this personally, but I can't just look at you and say, oh yeah, there's somebody who's, who knows Jesus. Oh, there's another person. who We can't do that. We know Jesus as King and Savior can save you right now if you don't know him. It's not about coming to church, although I'm glad you're here. It's not about putting money in the offering plate Although that keeps things moving, keeps us to be able to reach. It's not about being a, a, a good person and help, helping your neighbor, although that's, that's right and proper. It's not about that. It's about trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone for heaven. Not Jesus plus good works, not Jesus plus uh, uh, offerings, not Jesus plus anything, and not Jesus minus anything. It's Christ and Christ. The king that came through those gates in the Jerusalem is the gate to heaven. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. Father, we thank you so very much for who you are. We thank you for loving us. I thank you, Lord, for speaking to us today. I thank you for the symbolism of the picture that you gave us 2,000 years ago, walking through those gates, riding that donkey through those gates, establishing yourself, letting everybody know, telling everybody that you are the Messiah King, the one who is King of all kings, the one who has saved us, who has rescued us from an eternity of darkness and given us an eternity of light with you. Lord, I want to also thank you for the opportunity to give back. We pray for the offering today, Lord, whether it's from people uh, at home, online, or, or here uh, in the back there, Lord. We just thank you for, uh, for providing. We thank you for allowing us the opportunity to be able to get your word to the rest of the world. Please bless the offerings today. We love you so very much. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen.